Where is hope to be found today? That is a question that every one of you at one point in your life will have to be answered. Where is hope to be found today? Uh, and in the 20th century, hope was a word that was invoked by many, many dictatorial, totalitarian ideologies. For Moscow, for communists, it was Moscow. For racists, it was Berlin. Where is it today? Today is hope an illusion? Is it a trap? Or is it something that, like love, cannot be defined, but must be experienced? We hear a lot of how you feel on a lot of the serious issues and what you went through, but I would like to know what do you consider beautiful and strong in the world now? <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I'm very serious. Kind of for me to be with a young person studying is great. But of course there are moments when you are not with me. <laughs> 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 Look, I love music. I cannot work without music. I love beauty. Uh, it's truly, really, when I see a beautiful person, a beautiful girl or a nice young man, and then I, I realize the potential in you and in her and in him, that's, it, 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 it elevates me. I was just wondering, in all of your experiences, what is the greatest life lesson that you've ever learned? Is not to allow the enemy that still exists in some shape and in some people to govern my life ever. I don't want the enemy to tell me when to rejoice and when to laugh or when to cry. I decide. At the ultimate uh, moment, I believe that we are free. I would rather use a better word than that. Every one of us is sovereign. I am sovereign as a human being, as you are. And never allow anyone to violate that sovereignty in you. So, I was a number, but more than a number. And today I have a name. And only because I have a name that you are here today. <laughs> Thank you. Please stand and join me as we welcome to the Schuster Podium a good friend of the university, a cherished friend of mine, Nobel laureate, Professor Ellie Bissell. A few years ago, I was invited to address the General Assembly of the United Nations. I called my lecture, Will the World Ever Learn? And I came to a sad conclusion. The world hasn't learned. Had the world learned, there would have been no Cambodia with its two million deaths. No Srebrenica in Yugoslavia. No Rwanda. No Darfur. What else can we do? except teach our people, every segment of our people, the lessons of respect, the lessons of diversity, which means diversity of belief and diversity of opinion and diversity of attitude and diversity of language and background. We must. What else can we do to see to it that the world is a better world, that peace can become not only a dream, but a desire. A desire. Simply to say, enough, we cannot take it anymore. Enough violence, enough fanaticism, enough hatred. My God, it's enough. What have we learned? If not that hatred is absurd. It means nothing. For everything is possible. This is what we have learned for good and evil. We have seen it in those times of darkness, and no one had imagined that evil had such power. 
and we learned to regret our lack of knowledge or vision or fantasy. Evil too prove that everything is possible when you allow it to function. But the same is true of good. Everything is possible when you choose to fight evil, to create a sense of solidarity between men and women of all origins, of all creeds, all beliefs, all conditions. What do you wish to teach the world and what is the beauty of teaching? Oh, first of all, look, I live in a world of young people. And the older I get, the younger they get. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. Um, <clears throat> what I try to teach, really, with my books and my lectures, is at least to sensitize them. If I teach, let's say, Sophocles or Shakespeare, it's because I want my students and my readers to be sensitive to their anguish and to their pain. That's all I want, really. I want the student or, my, or the reader to be more sensitive, again, to the otherness of the other, to the pain of the other, to the dream of the other, to the joy of the other, but always to know that the other is there. What can we do to honor the memories of those we've lost? Oh, it is really by helping those who are alive live a good, creative, honorable existence. That is the thing that we must do. Otherwise, simply to remember. And then what? We must do something with our memory. It's sad. We must build on that sadness, not negate it, but build on that sadness so as help others who, when they are in a state of sadness, to know that we are with them always. Thank you.